This is the second section of the integer programming topic. In this section, we're going to look at some optimization problems and try to formulate the problems into integer programming. This is actually very similar to what you've done in the OR1 course, in which you have also optimization problems, and then you try to formulate them into linear programming. Let's take a look at the first example. So there are four investments that we may choose. And then each investment will return, will give us a return, which is represented by its net present value or NPV. And then if we would like to invest at an investment, at time present, we need to put some cash into uh, that investment. It is said here that at time present, we have 14,000 available for investment. And then we are asked to find the solution for this problem such that we can maximize the NPV obtained from investments one to four. To formulate an optimization problem, I usually start with the objective function. For me, I find it the easiest. So here we see that we are asked to maximize the NPV obtained from investment one to four. And then we see um, investment one will give us NPV $16,000, investment two, 22, investment three, 12, and then investment four, 8,000. So we're asked to maximize the sum of the NPV. So simply we can say maximize Z equals to 16 times X1 plus 22 times X2 plus 12 times X3 plus eight times X4. Now we also need to define what are the axes that we have uh, written before. So what is x1, what is x2, and so on. I think it's quite straightforward to see that we get $16, $16,000, I mean, if we invest in investment one. If we don't, it is obvious that we will not obtain this $16,000. So the decision variables are pretty simple. It can be represented as a zero one variable. So xj equals one if we invest at investment j. But xj equals zero if we do not choose to invest at that investment. So the decision variables x1, x2, x3, and x4 will only take the value of either 0 or 1. So this is a 0, 1 integer programming problem. Now let's think about the constraint. It is mentioned in the problem that we only have $14,000 available for investment. Why is that the constraint? If you look at the objective function, suppose our money is unlimited, then to make the decision is very easy. You just invest in investment one, two, three, and four, because you have a lot of money, so you can do it. You can invest in all investments. But now you see that your money is, uh, your, the amount of money that you have is only 14,000. So clearly this is the, constraint. How to formulate the constraint? You put on the right hand side saying that whatever you spend must be less than or equal to 14,000. And then how much money do you spend? Well, you see that if you invest at investment one, you will have to spend $5,000. So you write down five times x1. If you choose to invest at investment two, you need to spend $7,000. If you choose to invest at investment three, you need to spend $4,000. And then if you choose to invest at investment four, you must spend $3,000. So the sum of all this initial cost that you have to pay for the investments the sum of all those costs must be less than or equal to 14. 
once you've got the objective function, decision variable, constraint, now don't forget to put on the sign restrictions. Means that how would you restrict the value of the variables? In this problem, it is obvious that we have to restrict the decision variable to take the value of either 0 or 1 because 1 means we are choosing to invest at that investment and 0 if we don't. So up to this point, we haven't talked about how to find the optimal solution. But let's see the optimal solution for the problem that we just formulated. So the optimal solution is to invest at investment 2, 3, and 4. That's why x2, x3, and x4 equal 1 and not investing at investment 1. That's why x1 equals 0 with the z value is 42. Actually, if we look at the ratio between the NPV of each investment compared to the initial cost of each investment, investment 1 actually has the highest ratio. It gives you $16 NPV for the initial cost of $5. So the ratio is 3.2 is the highest among all investments. However, in this problem, uh, whenever you choose investment 1, you will end up with $2,000 remaining that you cannot spend uh, for anything. So for example, you choose uh, investment 1 and investment 2, you will have $2,000 remaining. It's the same case if you choose 1, 3, and 4, you will have $2,000 remaining that you cannot spend for anything. So apparently in this case, it is best to spend the entire money, $14,000, for investment 2, 3, and 4. An integer programming that has only one constraint can also be called as knapsack problem. The reason is uh, because we can convert the previous problem that we just formulated into a problem of um, deciding which item sets we are going to take with our knapsack that has limited capacity. So for example, we can say we have a knapsack uh, that can hold up to 14 pounds of items and then each item has its own weight and then each item has also its own benefit. We'll try to pick the item that gives us uh, the total maximum the maximum total benefits while not exceeding the capacity of our knapsack, 14 pounds. Now let's move on to the next example, which is actually exactly the same as the previous example. But now we are asked to add three more constraints. Let's do each of these constraints one by one. So the first constraint says that Stocko can invest in at most two investments. If we look at our decision variable, xj equals 1 if we choose to invest at investment j, xj equals 0 if we don't. So it's quite straightforward to see that uh, formulating this constraint can be done in saying that the sum of x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 must be less than or equal to 2 because it says at most 2 so we here put less than or equal to 2 okay so if you invest in 1 and 3 it's okay because the sum is 2 but if you invest in 2 3 and 4 it is not okay because it means you are investing at 3 investments the second constraint says that if Stocker invest in investment 2, they must also invest in investment 1. So let's try to see all the possibilities. If we invest in investment 2, means that x2 equals 1, what would be the value of x1? The constraint says that if you invest in investment 2, then you also must invest in investment 1. So here it is obvious if x2 equals 1, 
the only possible answer for x1 is that x1 must equal 1. But then let's think about the other possibility. If x2 equals 0, what can you say about x1? x2 equals 0 means that we do not invest in investment 2. According to the constraint, well, you may or may not invest in investment 1 because the constraint only says if you invest in investment 2, but it doesn't say what happens if you don't. So here it is clear that if you do not invest at investment 2, then x1 can be either 0 or 1. Looking at this condition, you can see that x2 must always be less than or equal to x1. Let's check this condition. 1 is less than or equals to 1. 0 is less than or equal to 0. 0 is less than or equal to 1. Okay, so this constraint will force the condition into that if you invest in investment 2, you must also invest in investment 1. The last constraint says that if Stockholm invests in investment 2, they cannot invest in investment 4. So same as before, let's try to look at all possibilities. If Stockholm invests in investment 2, means that x2 equals 1. What would be the possible value of x4? Since the constraint says that they cannot invest in investment 4, so it is obvious that x4 must equal 0. Because you invest at investment 2, you cannot invest in investment 4. Now let's take a look at the other possibility. If we don't invest in investment 2, means that x2 equals 0, what would be the value of x4? Again, the constraint doesn't say anything about not investing in investment 2. It means that if x2 equals 0, then x4 can be either 0 or 1. Now, how to formulate these possibilities? We can say that the sum of x2 and x4 must always be less than or equal to 1. Let's see how this constraint works. So if x2 equals 1 means that we choose to invest at investment 1, this constraint will force x4 to become 0. However, if x2 is 0, this constraint will allow x4 to be either 0 or 1. Because 0 plus 0 is less than or equals to 1, 0 plus 1 also less than or equal to 1. So that's how we formulate all these three constraints, and that's the end of this section. If you have any questions, feel free to leave your questions in the comment section. Thank you.